Why did the Nazis drive military vehicles to a random hole in the Austrian woods? And what does that have to do with oranges in California? Today, I'll be discussing a physical phenomena that creeps around your feet every night. And in some cases, it can create some odd geography. If you go for a hike in a certain part of the Eastern Alps, you'll find a series of conspicuous forest clearings in a landscape otherwise dominated by towering silver fir. These well-drained, low-lying meadows seem like the most inviting campsite at first glance, but they're one of the worst places you could pitch your tent, unless you're prepared for a much colder night. Take a closer look at the edges of the depression. You'll see black pine getting progressively smaller, shrubbier, and more twisted as you walk down slope until they disappear entirely. And at the very bottom, you'll only find very small alpine plants. It's a reversed tree line. The bottom of the hole gets far too cold for trees to grow. In fact, one of the coldest temperatures ever recorded in Central Europe, minus 52.6 degrees Celsius, comes from this hole. The nearby mountain peak, Sonblik, is more than twice the elevation of this depression, but has only gotten down to minus 37.4 degrees Celsius. The bottom of the Grenlock can be 30 degrees Celsius colder than the rim. How is this possible? Well, it's a combination of unique geology and basic physics. Every day, the sun heats the Earth's surface, which heats the air above it. At night, the surface loses heat due to the emission of infrared radiation. The colder surface cools the air above it, causing the air to become denser. And this colder, denser air flows down slopes. It drains like water through valleys, continuously moving downhill unless it's obstructed. It can be slowed down on a small scale behind forest edges or walls, but it generally manages to find a way to keep flowing. Which brings us to geology. There really aren't a lot of large holes in nature. Free draining valleys are a lot more common. Holes tend to get filled with sediment, and in any climate with reasonable rainfall, they'll fill with water, in which case the exiting stream will eventually cut through the edge to create a valley, or the lake will fill with sediment. But there is an exception in limestone geology. Limestone, or calcium carbonate, is quite easily dissolved by rainwater and snow melt. Groundwater will erode limestone from within, creating crevices and caverns that will collapse to form sinkholes or large depressions. Those depressions can persist over time in part because the underlying limestone keeps eroding, and also because there's virtually no surface runoff to carry sediment downhill. Limestone is extremely permeable, and so most of the rain that falls on limestone hills will immediately seep down into the bedrock, leaving no surface water to carry dirt downhill. The holes stay holes. And if cold air from a broad area pools into these depressions, it won't go anywhere. It'll be trapped. All the coldest air will dislodge slightly warmer air due to its higher density. The deeper the cold pool, the more heat is lost from the lowest air layer. Temperatures will drop rapidly, destroying all life except the hardiest organisms. The Germans in World War II saw great testing potential here in the Grenlock. To invade the Soviet Union would mean traveling east, away from the warmth of the Atlantic Ocean. Who knew how long they'd be stuck in the east? And if they were still there in winter, they wanted to know their vehicles would still work. The Grenlock was the perfect place to test the cold tolerance of their engines. A nearly identical phenomenon can be found in Utah. Peter Sinks is a half mile wide, treeless depression, underlain by limestone, again, that has seen temperatures as low as minus 56.3 degrees Celsius. This is the second coldest temperature ever recorded in the lower 48 United States, beaten by a fraction of a degree much farther north in Montana. We have 67 mountains in the contiguous U.S. that are over 14,000 feet in elevation, and this basin at only 8,000 feet can get colder than all of them. The temperature difference can, between the bottom of the depression and the rim can be as much as 39 degrees Celsius. 
Farmers are all too familiar with the basic concept of a frost hollow. Take, for instance, orchard owners. The Central Valley in California is an excellent place to grow oranges. Protected from cold continental air masses in winter by the Sierra Nevadas, but also isolated from the cooling effects of the California current and coastal upwelling. Oranges need more summer heat to ripen compared to lemons, which are more ideal for the coast. The dry valley air also cools quickly at night, allowing the fruit to gain a deep orange color that increases market appeal. Despite being so ideal, nearly all commercial production of oranges is concentrated on the upper slopes of the valley, away from the bottom because there is one downside to this citrus paradise. This enormous valley is semi-enclosed, only opening in a relatively tight gap. Cold air becomes entrenched, and so the valley floor is an entirely different USDA hardiness zone compared to the valley edges. Hardiness zones are determined by average extreme winter minimum temperatures. Basically, how cold does it usually get here, at worst? Some parts of the upper slope are even two zones warmer than the valley floor. This can mean the difference between losing a year's harvest of frost or losing the trees altogether. The effect isn't as drastic as in a completely enclosed depression, but the underlying cause is the same. Cold air flows into the valley more easily than it flows out. Compare this to something like the upper Tennessee Valley, where Winters get milder the farther down you go. This is more typical. There are a few other large examples of frost hollows out west, however. One is the San Luis Valley, where Coors Brewing Company gets most of its barley. The northern part of the valley is an endorheic basin, meaning it drains nowhere, and the southern end of the valley is almost enclosed by volcanic mountains and hills. The Rio Grande barely squeezes through the volcanic terrain. Cold air flows in more easily than it flows out. Aspen, Colorado is slightly higher in elevation and farther north than Alamosa in the middle of the San Luis Valley, yet the record low and the average January low are a lot colder in Alamosa. The Green River Basin in Wyoming was once a subtropical lake back in the Eocene. Now it's a lake of frigid air at night, a teeth-shattering zone three. You can actually see where cold air pours out of the basin through the canyon that the Green River carved. On the Snake River Plain in Idaho, volcanic hills formed, which blocked the flow of several rivers. Instead of eroding through the obstacle, the rivers actually disappear underground, flowing through the highly fractured basalt flows. Since the water didn't carve a path for cold air to take, the cold air just settles in this depression. Finally, Nevada has many endorheic basins, salt flats. Water flows in and just evaporates. And in many of these, the basins with higher terrain on all sides can have much colder extremes than the adjacent slopes. Scattered across the surface of our planet, there are lakes of icy air. They may be deadly to some and inconvenient to others, but without a doubt, they add yet another fascinating layer of variability that diversifies ecosystems, the economy, and the human experience. Thanks for watching.